On behalf of State Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister, I'd like to welcome everyone today to our presentation on the 2019-2020 English Learner Frequently Asked Question Update webinar. My name is Dan Rule, and I'm here with Yuseli Frere. We're both with, in the Office of English Language Proficiency here at SDE. So before we start, uh, I want to just go ahead and make just give you some general uh, guidelines on the PowerPoint today. First off, you're going to see some fairly wordy slides, and I know that breaks the cardinal rule of PowerPoint, but I thought for this particular presentation, I wanted to make sure that everyone was reading or have access to the policy that's in the FAQ word for word, so there's no miscommunication about what you're going to see when the actual completed document is released here, probably in the next couple of days. Um, anything that you see in italics on this PowerPoint is going to be what was directly taken out of the new FAQ language. So if it's not in italics, it's just kind of a summary. If it's in italics, that's the exact thing. And so I want to make sure we're all reading this exactly, make sure we all understand exactly what it's saying. In terms of questions, if you can please just go ahead and hold off on questions until the end. We'll go ahead and I'm sure we'll have uh, plenty of time to go over every single thing and we can address them a little bit more thoroughly than we can if we're stopping the presentation um, every slide. So go ahead and if you do have a question, go ahead and put it in the text box and we'll just, when we're done, we'll just go back and just knock them out one by one. All right. And as I said to uh, Anita before we started, and just to make sure everyone's on, on the same page on this, we will go ahead and post this PowerPoint if there are no changes that we feel we need to make based on the feedback from this uh, from this webinar. So as long as everything is good with everybody, we'll go ahead and post this PowerPoint along with the Vimeo link to make sure everyone has access. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're gonna we laid out. This is kind of as in the same order as the actual FAQ, so it might jump around a little bit, but just be aware of that. So the first thing, foreign exchange students. One of the current one of the questions we tended to get a lot was when a foreign exchange student fills out a home language survey, what what's their what's the rules? And basically, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page that the foreign language student home language survey should reflect their current living situation, not their home living situation in their home country. So wherever they are at that moment in an English, English only speaking household, that's what uh, it should reflect on their HLS. Sign language and how does sign language play into um, EL and bilingual status. So again, this is italic. So this is going to be right out of the right out of policy. So EL status. If a student has a language other than English present on their HLS, in addition to ASL or some other form of sign language, and this example would be ASL Spanish Spanish, they are to be tested with the WIDA screener and the school would follow the current state protocol for assessing EL students until proficiency. Second point, if a student has a language other than English present on their HLS, but that language is ASL or some other form of sign language, in this case would be ASL English English, they would not to be, they are not to be tested for EL status on the WIDA screener. So basically, if a student is, their only, their only language other than English is ASL, the being moved into the WIDA, being moved, being identified as EL would not be appropriate. Given this, the school would need to have staff, a staff member certified to administer both the WIDA screener and access for ELLs if they have students that meet the criteria described in the first category. So for bilingual status, the school should follow the same bilingual qualification process as any other student in the state, but omitting WIDA testing. If a student reports ASL or another form of sign, English English on their HLS, they would be considered less often and would qualify for bilingual status in the same form as we always do. If they have a qualifying OSTP score or a qualifying norm reference test score with the same rule applying that a qualifying NRT score does not negate a non-qualifying OSTP score, same as other students. A student with ASL, ASL English, or ASL, ASL, ASL responses on their home language survey would be treated the same as a uh, non-hearing impaired more often student, would be exempt from the WIDA testing requirements described directly above, and would qualify for bilingual status. So they would be treated just like another more often student, but they wouldn't be held to the, the WIDA testing standard. So in, in terms of correction, if a district has previously identified students as EL with the WIDA screener that would not have met the criteria described in, in the previous slides, the district should change the status of those students to align with the processes described above. 
To reiterate, students whose only language other than English is ASL or another form of sign should not be and should never have been identified as EL. And if you have any questions on that, feel free to uh, put them in the chat box. Okay. Whoa. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Sorry about that. That was weird. Okay. Foreign transcripts. We had a few questions last year about what do we do with uh, incoming student foreign transcripts. So we added it, we um, spoke with our uh, counseling department here at SDE and kind of uh, laid out what the baseline rules are to award credit based on uh, classes that were taken, taken in a previous, in a former foreign country. So there's three rules. The first is that the transcript must be translated into English and this can be done by the district, by local staff, if they possess the appropriate mastery of the language. And this is a subjective, somewhat subjective um, measurement, but I would wanna feel confident that if you had, you know, if you had a, a very fluent uh, Spanish speaker and reader on staff that they could, you know, effectively translate a uh, Spanish uh, transcript in the Spanish language. Uh, but I would not, trust maybe like Google Translate or something along those lines if you had one that was written in, you know, maybe a not, not as common language in this day. Second, districts may award credit based solely on course description and grade if they're confident that the course content was similar to a course taught in alignment with the Oklahoma academic standards. That being said, best practice would include a formal content area assessment to gauge student knowledge prior to awarding course credit. And thirdly, districts may use a locally created content area assessment or a standardized norm reference tense to award credit. So those are the three, the three rules that our counseling department is comfortable with. Moving on. So Title III, there was a couple issues last year about um, just general wording on Title III in the home language survey. So we added some clarifying language regarding qualification and application for Title III funds, which aren't any for the bigger districts won't be any kind of surprise it was basically adding in general student counts that would be required to uh, receive a title three allocation as well as uh, some consortium language as well and a new entry regarding private school participation in district title three programs just so it's formal that we have it written that if you do have a private school if you do get a title three allocation and you do have a private school in your district that school is entitled to participate in that Title III program, essentially. So English only student H, uh, home language survey responses, but there's an obvious language barrier evident in the classroom. We added an entry, and this has been our, our stated policy for some time, but we, wanted, we realized it had never been formally written down in the FAQ. So we just added an entry explicitly stating the right to screen a student for EL status if deemed appropriate by site and or district staff. And this is regardless of whatever the HLS response is initially stated. So we just wanna make sure that, that was written in black and white. That one shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And we added a standalone code or a standalone entry regarding the 1637 coding. And that is the new English learner, but declined supplemental EL services. That should now be in everyone's, everyone should be aware that this code exists um, in your student information system. And it's basically, it operates just like the 20, 349 code, the students would still test WIDA every year. If they're still EL, they still factor into accountability the exact same way. It's just that you're formally stating that you are not providing them supplemental EL services that you would, you know, they, they basically are waiving services. So you're going to see lots of updates to anywhere that's basically 2349 and the FAQ will also have the 1637 referenced. And 1637, like I said, now has its own code or its own entry. Okay, uh, EL identification and NMAR clarification. So the time frame for testing, uh, we clarified the language regarding the allowable time to screen potentially EL students. So the new language reads as follows, any potential EL student enrolled within the first 30 calendar days from the start date of school must be placement tested within those first 30 calendar days. Any potential EL who enrolls after the first 30 calendar days of school must be placement tested within 14 calendar days of enrollment. And this grew out of uh, some miscommunication in terms of when districts thought, how much time districts thought that they were allowed to screen students. Um, we just had a couple little miscommunications on that, so we just wanted to clarify the language. EL identification and significant cognitive disabilities. We added language stating that the successful completion of any single domain in regards to 
uh, WIDA access will disqualify a student from uh, no measurable academic response consideration. They cannot be NMAR if they can completely uh, if they can successfully complete a minimum of one domain. Questionable EL status. This was kind of the big one this year. And this is an outgrowth of multiple districts uh, that use the third party and either one of the two third party EL data tracking uh, platforms that are available in the state. Both of those platforms have uh, increased their ability to identify former students or identify students that had been previously coded as EL in another district have now moved in are now in a, in a new district and that and maybe entered that district with uh, a home language survey that was English, English, English. Well, the, the third party platform then says, well, no, the student was two years ago identified as an EL in a, you know, another metro district, something along those lines. That's been happening more and more. So we wanted to lay down formal guidance as to what to do when this happens. So here we go. If a student has attended school for at least the two previous years as a designation other than EL 2349 and has not received formal EL services in that time, districts may at their discretion assess the student with the WIDA screener and move the student to first year proficiency coding for the current year if the student meets the state proficiency criteria of a minimum 4.8 composite. So basically here's the scenario on this. My district has a student, they're a freshman. Uh, they enroll um, three months late, or uh, they enroll beginning of the year. They have English, English, English on the home language survey. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be. Um, nothing throws a flag for me. But then my third party EL system says no, two years ago or uh, three years ago, they were identified as an EL and they never exited out. And then they maybe moved a district in between me and that initial identifying district. In this case, the student had attended um, school for at least the previous two years as not an EL, and I say, okay, I'll go ahead and give them the WIDA screener. If they test 4.8, I would go ahead and move that student to 1636.03 for the, you know, because that it's reflecting the fact that they're now first, we're allowing first year, moving to first year proficient based on the screener, and 03 because their most recent home language survey is English, 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 though they would not be considered bilingual. So the decision to establish EL status in this manner should be based on a collaborative review of the students of a student's available academic history. And this would be a review of grades, uh, whatever state national test scores may be available. In these cases, um, students in these, in these cases should only be screened if upon review of their academic history, the district feels the student would continue to be successful without the support of supplemental EL services. So if you do a review of the student's grades and it looks like they're they're really struggling in class by not being EL, I would say that go ahead and move that. You, you do the option to move them directly to EL again. We are giving you the option to use the screener to move them out of EL status without moving them back in to a formal 2349 again. But if it is obvious on review of the academic history of the student for the last couple of years that they probably were struggling in class, it's moving to 2349 directly and then just moving them right back into their original status. <coughs> Students recoded to first year proficient status in this manner would not be eligible for OSTP testing accommodations and would be factored in and would be factored into site accountability as proficient for the purposes of the ELPA indicator. Okay. If upon review of the available student information, the district elects to uh, screen the student and the student does not meet proficiency, the student should then be recoded to EL status, either 2349 or 1637, depending, and will assess with the WIDA access in the WIDA spring testing window. And if upon review of the available information, the district elects to not screen the student, this is my, the scenario I was just referring to, the student should be recoded to EL status, 2349 or 1637, and will assess with the WIDA access for ELLs in the WIDA spring test window. And that's pretty much how we're gonna handle this moving forward, unless there's some component of this that we're missing. Okay, wrongly identified. Uh, we clarified, and this was again, one of those stated policies that we realized was not in the actual written component of the FAQ. So the timeline to correct wrongly identified students Districts wishing to correct a mistake in assigning EL status must complete the steps below within the same academic year of the initial EL identification. So, <coughs> excuse me, if a student 
is wrongly identified. Basically, you have within that academic year to figure that out and move that student out of status by doing the steps that are out that we did have listed in the, the former FAQ or the current FAQ. Uh, what we had happen was a few districts tried to m come back three and four years later and say that the student had been initially misidentified back in you know 2013, 2014, and that's not appropriate. I mean, if there's a misidentification, we need to be on top of getting it within that, within that academic year. Parental opt-out of EL services. We added this, added this following supplemental language. Parents must sign a completed student ELAP detailing the student's current proficiency status and those specific services the parent or guardian will be waiving. Both the signed letter and the ELAP should be stored in the student's cumulative folder. Digital storage regarding these records is an acceptable alternative as long as the district maintains the ability to provide evidence upon request that parents have been appropriately informed. And this wasn't, this is really just formalizing uh, what the vast majority of districts are already doing. Uh, once that ELAP has been, if you do have a student uh, whose parents or guardians want to opt out of uh, formal uh, district EL supplemental services, and they sign in the LAP, the vast majority of times that ELP goes stores in the QM folder anyway, but we did have an issue where this was not happening. So we wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page. And this is the expectation that 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 documentation is stored to be referenced later, if need be. All right, band exit uh, corrections. So band exit, proce band exit process for a non OSTP year student. And we had a clarifying language in the FAQ. Uh, regarding the requirements for students to exit EL status via the ELP band exit process if they were not in an OSTP year. And this won't be a surprise to anybody. That's why I didn't actually put the text here. It's basically take, it took the text that was in the guidance document that's available on the assessment website for when we had those uh, second graders that didn't test uh, OSTP that year, so it didn't have those tests. It just put that language that was on that document in the FAQ itself. So it, and nothing really, this didn't change anything. It's just we, we added it in. Redesignation of alternate access takers after three years of testing, and we added, added an additional documentation requirement. Uh, students being exited under this criteria should have the three consecutive years of WIDA score reports attached to a brief letter documenting the district decision and any other supporting documentation used to justify reclassification placed in the student's cumulative folder. So this has to do with, <coughs> excuse me, the alternate access uh, testers and being able to exit out of EL status if they uh, do three year, three consecutive years of no growth on the alt access, but just a little bit of a heightened um, documentation requirement. Again, something that most districts were probably already doing anyway, but we just wanted to formalize it. Okay, the ELPA ban request submission timeline. We amended the previous guidance regarding the ELPA ban request submission test or submission window. So the new text reads as follows At the outset of the academic year, ELP band committees must be convened and reclassification and exit decisions made for ELs in grades three through 12 have, who have scored within the ELP band on their most recent access for ELLs or alternate access for ELLs test. All band request documentation must then be submitted within, ELPA band request, within the ELPA band request window, which will be set yearly by OSDE. District staff will be notified via email of the band request window dates. While every effort will be made to provide districts with sufficient time to complete their ELP band exit requests, please note that the ELPA band window will be open as soon as data are available and as for as long as the accountability timeline can accommodate. Districts are encouraged to account for this possibility in planning for any staff that may be required to complete the ELP band exit process. So just a little uh, history on this one. Essentially what the prob what the issue that was a that arose with the former, with allowing districts 30 days from their first day of school, is that there's about a six week span of start dates in the state. And at the back end of those start dates, we could not accommodate 30 full, 30 calendar days from the back end of the start dates across the state without running over the other timelines that need to be in place to, to ensure that we have all the calculations done for the site report cards. That's, that's where this came from. So we will try to be, or I shouldn't say try, we will message this as much as possible to make sure that everyone understands when the windows open and these are gonna be at the same time that many of the other windows in terms of the correction windows for the accountability reporting 
application are open. So it's not like it's going to be outside of anything else that's going to be working at that time. But we will uh, make sure that every district understands uh, when that window is open. And that unfortunately may require some districts to do this prior, uh, at least a little bit prior to when their actual first day of school would be. So it's an unfortunate it's an unfortunate compromise, but given the other timelines that this particular, that this data needs to operate within, within the uh, state report card or within the site report card overall, it's just something that we had to do. All right, test window enrollment. So in the previous FAQ, we had a, two, a standing two week rule for designating whether or not students were, were to be just screened or screened and access tested if they enrolled within the actual WIDA window, the spring testing window. Uh, what the problem was is that that two week window often overlapped uh, uh, spring break because spring break oftentimes falls in that window. So we went ahead and moved the two week rule to 10 instructional days. So if uh, the text reads as follows, if a new potential EL student enrolls within the WIDA test window prior to the final 10 instructional days of the window and their home language survey responses indicate that they may be a potential EL, the student should be given the WIDA placement test, a KOEP screen reader model. If the student tests as an English learner, they should have been, then be given the appropriate access test prior to the close of the testing window. If the student enrolls within the final 10 instructional days of the window, the district is responsible only for administering an appropriate WIDA placement test, be it the KWEP screen or a model. So essentially, we're kind of accounting for that the fact that spring break is in there. You might actually get a little bit more than two weeks if it overlaps in terms of calendar days, if it overlaps spring break, but instructional days seem like the most fair compromise in this. So if a student comes in, you just count back instructional days within the test window. If it's greater than 10, they test, uh, both the they get identified and access tested if it's fewer than 10 they just they just get uh, screened okay ostp accommodations this is one that um, i got a few questions on because we redid the table of who gets accommodations in the ostp test guide the uh this is, all, I think that some people got confused on this one because it requires you either, to the, if you write it one way, it's telling you what kids get, what accommodations kid, kids might get the next, the, the subsequent year. If you write it another way, it's telling you what they needed to be in the previous year. So understand it's covering two, two years here. So this isn't the entire table. This is just an example of the, the top two rows because I didn't want to, you know, clutter up the uh, screen any more than it already is. But essentially we have the first, the first line here uh, is asking, you know, in a current year eligibility, does this student receive accommodations? And if the, in the previous year, and how this is most to be read is that if I'm looking at this for 20, uh, 2019, 2020 OSTP testing, and I wanna know for coming up in the spring testing window here in a few months, does this kiddo get accommodations? That's, that's, the, that's the angle that I'm looking at this from. So I look at this, this table and I say, okay, this student, his final year last year was his final year as an English learner. So he's first year proficient this year. He scored a proficient or advanced on his ELA uh, last year in 2019. So therefore he does not receive accommodations. And conversely, I'm looking at the same kiddo last year. He was uh, it was his final year he tested he tested proficient last year but on that same tested year uh, last year for ELA on his OSTP he got basic or below basic so therefore he does receive uh, accommodations so I tried to be a little bit more explicit and for every row there's six um, final first and second year proficient uh, in the actual FAQ each one of those rows has an example scenario to kind of just talk through it, just to kind of clarify any kind of miscommunication that there may be regarding who gets accommodations and who doesn't. Okay, 
So we can move on to, that's, that's pretty much it. There wasn't a ton of changes, uh, but we wanted to make sure that some of, some of them being a little stuff that was brand new, we wanted to make sure that uh, we had a chance to make, give, every, give everyone a chance to give feedback. We can go ahead and start going through questions. So feel free to type, if you had a question waiting, feel free to type them in. So the first one is, will the writing test booklets be automatically sent based on the number of students taking the online portion? You, Sally, what do you got? Um, for grades one through three, um, they, were, they would be automatically um, sent. Now, if you opt out, if, if you opt in for grades four and five, those are done um, during the additional orders, order materials time if you wanted um, to opt those students in to do the writing portion as a paper test. Okay. All right. If the answer on the HLS is H ASL Spanish English, will it be considered less often or more often? That's a great question. Um, Let me let me look at the home language survey and look at the guidance that we have. And it would depend also on whether or not, well, the student would would test, it might be irrelevant because if the student tested, if you would you'd go ahead and screen the student in this scenario because they have a language other than English and ASL on their home language survey. So if they screened and tested not, you know, uh, tested not proficient, then they would go ahead and be 2349 and it wouldn't matter. The more often, less often status wouldn't matter because they'd be automatically qualified for bilingual. But if they did test proficient in that, the, what throws me on that one is that I'm not sure if we would consider them, what rules would consider them just qualifying for bilingual if they did test proficient with having Spanish on the home language survey. So that's a great question and I'm gonna have to clarify that in the guidance. Uh, let's see, I'm not understanding what qualifies an alternate access tester if they, have, if they have shown no growth for the last three years. Can you elaborate? So this was an allowance that we started last, two years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it, it was a way that many districts had, had basically voiced to us concern that many of their kids that were taking alt access we're simply not ever going to hit the, what we consider the, you know, standard exit requirement. That they plateaued very early and they just were not, no matter what kind of interventions were done, they simply were not making progress. So we created the allowance to do three year and exit if, if basically if no growth was shown. So if the student kind of capped out maybe the first year and was actually declining in subsequent years or, or just tested three years uh, at the same level, that can qualify a student to exit EL, EL status. Um, I just got one that says, can you repeat that question? I'm not sure what question it was referring to. So uh, next question is 14 calendar days on screening goes into effect now. Yeah, it would, you know, at this point in time, that's always been the rule. Uh, well, actually it's, yeah, it's two weeks is what the federal guidance says. Uh, that's always been the rule and right now we're past the initial 30 days from the start of any any one school so yes if you had a student enroll at this point in time that had a language or multiple languages other than English on their home language survey you would have two weeks to get that student um, two weeks or 14 calendar days to get that student identified uh, what kind of documentation would you use to exit a student who's shown no growth on alt access for the last three years uh, that would just be the um, the, the the alternate the, the alternate access test report um, showing scores and student identification, and then the letter requiring right, Sally. So, yes. And then then that's just that is the that is the exit. Um, and thought it was 15 days. No, the actual federal in in ESSA it actually says two weeks. So just you know, um, is the Alternate access only for students that take the OAP. Yes. yes. Go ahead, you said. Yes, it's only for students that <clears throat> take the OAP. OAP. Okay. 
Okay, are districts required to provide documentation to exit alt access testers similar to the ELP band? Are, and I think that you're referring to an ELP band request. Um, no, there's not actual forms to do that, but that is something that we would that before this next round comes before the next round of ELP comes around, we might want to make that we might want to clarify that policy a little bit because right now if you just if you for accountability purposes, I'm not sure how we'd have to work to work with the office of accountability to make sure that those students to see if it would be appropriate to give those students points within the accountability model. That's one of those things that we haven't really addressed with this yet. So that one will be guidance pending. Um, so if you have an alternate assessment, whoa, they're coming in too quick. So if you have an alternate assessment student that never responds on the access, he could be exited. So, It would be well. I mean, when you say never responds, I'm not sure if that you're if you're implying that the student is NMAR or not. It would be different if the student is just refusing to participate, as opposed to the student can't participate. I think that sometimes you know we have to have, uh, you know, kind of a situational judgment based on what's going on. So that might be one that we need to talk about independently. Do the students that exit the alternate test after three years of no growth, do they become monitored or not? Yeah, they would still, they would still be considered former ELs. So they would still become, they would still code in as six, you'd move them to the redesignated 1636 and then whatever bilingual us, uh, whatever other code their home language survey justified. Uh, will we still be able to make a copy of the English learner WIDA testing FAQ and PowerPoint a separate document with the same changes you were referring to. We're going to post. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll post the new FAQ. It's um, as a PDF uh, now, but yeah, you can. I wouldn't print it out or make a copy. It's, it's big. <laughs> it's, it's 40 some odd pages. And um, I mean, you're more than welcome to print it out. Um, but yes, um, but we will post. Uh, yeah, we'll post the FAQ. I might not post, uh, depending on kind of what we figure out on the, the ASL question, I might either update or do a strike through on those particular um, slides, so. Um, let's see, okay, so I'm assuming, I got a he doesn't speak, I'm assuming this ref is referring to uh, whether or not that student could be exited. I think that we probably need to talk about it um, in a separate conversation and we'll, I'll have my contact information you saw his contact information at the end of this uh, at the end of this PowerPoint so let's get it let's go ahead and maybe set up a time to to talk directly are the FAE guidelines the same as for OSTP so the FAE guidelines for um, the I'm assuming the FAE guidelines for the ELPA indicator is what we're referring to and that is enrolled within the first 20 days of school and and not having an absence not having a more than 10 consecutive absences during that enrollment and prior to the beginning of the WIDA test window. That's the, that is the FAE criteria for um, ELPA. And that is actually in the, I wanna say it's the ELPA spotlight document available on the OSDE website. And also one of the things that I didn't mention here is that we also added some clarifying language in terms of the ELPA indicator in the FAQ We've expanded and um, provided a little more detail on how the ELPA indicator works as well. Okay. Um, can you repeat the answer for the writing booklet question from Karen at the very top? Yeah, I mean, that one, that question was Will the writing test booklets be automatically sent based on the number of students taking the online portion? And I'll let you, Sally, answer that one. Yes. Um, for grades one through to third grade, um, it will be automatically sent on there for you. Now, if you uh, decide to opt your students that are in fourth and fifth grade to do the writing um, test on paper pencil, then you will order those and the additional order materials. Um, and I, that I believe that is January 7th. 
for that. Um, but all of the ones that are already online for grades one through third grade will be automatically ordered for you when you submit how many you're going to do um, in those grades. Okay. Okay. Do IEP ELL students taking the regular access need to be managed in the AMS and need to be managed in the AMS in order to ensure their accommodations are provided on the WIDA? Or do I need to order additional materials in the additional ordering window? I don't know what you mean by the term managed. What do you think, Sally? Uh, if you, are you referring to like putting the accommodations and in, in what they need? Then yes, um, you can put submit that when you're, I mean, if, you're, if they're gonna use paper or braille or um, any of that, you can do that on there. And if that was, and if you want to ask a more clarifying question, feel free. Like I said, we have absolutely plenty of time to answer whatever you have. What is the criteria for K2 alternative, alternate access? Yes, I want to take that one. I mean, outside of the student being identified on an IEP and OAP, or actually, no, they wouldn't they test would, OAP because yeah. they're a K2. They're a K2. I mean, but if they have an IEP and then, and, um, you believe that they will be one of the students that can, will potentially take OAP, then they can um, take the alternate access. Um, but there's, for a screener, they're developing a um, um, K alternate assessment, but that's not, that's forthcoming. Okay. All right. 2019-2020 Oklahoma English Language Learner Identification and Placement Guidance Document Guideline states, uh, 15 CC days. It's on the OSD website. Just making sure there are no other mistakes in the document. All right. Thank you for pointing that out. I can go ahead and have that changed. If a student enrolls on the second day of school, are they to be screened within the 30 days or they fall into the 14 calendar day? Within the 30. So let me go ahead and back up real quick. Oh shoot, I passed it. <sighs> Sorry. Okay, here we go. Any potential EL student enrolled within the first 30 calendar days from the school from the start date of school must be placement tested within those first 30 calendar days. That is, <clears throat> that's what, that's, that's what ESSA says. So if you had a student enroll, and this is, you know, I mean, we're going by the letter of the law here, and I'm just going to, you know, qualify this. So technically, if you had a student enroll on the 27th day, you would have three days to get, to get that student weed attested. If you had a student enroll on the 31st day, you'd have two weeks to get that student tested. So, and those are calendar days. That's, that's what the loss, that's, that's just what, that's just what federal law is. Um, so the idea behind it is that you're given a little bit more time at the beginning of the year to get that initial um, round of testing done. And that scales back after that, that first month is over. And most of that testing should be out of the way to get kids placed, to get kids identified and placed within appropriate programming as soon as possible. Um, hold on. Okay. Um, are students taking the weed assessment included in the report card calculations? Are all students taking the weed assessment included in the report card calculations or only face students taking WIDA? So, <sighs> Okay, and this gets a this gets a little bit more complicated, and it's probably and really, it's its own webinar, but essentially, all the kiddos that are going to pop up in the accountability reporting application underneath the ELPA indicator, and I'm not sure if anyone I don't really want to get into going into in the, in the internet or anything, but if they if you go to the ELPA indicator on for the particular site that you're looking at in your district and you click on the denominator. 
the students are there because they're identified as ELs. Okay. Now you can filter those students to students that counted as FEI or and counted as FEI for that indicator. Some of those kids, and you might have a few kids in there that didn't test WIDA for whatever reason. Um, maybe they they were gone the the last two weeks of the you know the test window when they should have been tested. Who knows? But it's the FEI status that establishes whether or not the student goes into the indicator or not, not whether they actually completed the WIDA exam or, or the WIDA assessment or not. So if you did theoretically have a student that met FEI, met FEI, um, the ELPA indicator FEI criteria at a site, but didn't test WIDA, they're still going to count. Um, they're still, they will not add a point to the numerator on that one. They're, they'll just count in the overall. Um, and feel free to ask another question about that, if that wasn't clear. Our district got an email saying we did not meet the end size of 10 for the ELPA indicator on a report card. Is this a generic end size for all district? Or does it correlate to size of the district at all? No. And, and is the minimum, the end size of 10 is minimum for any, any site in any district, regardless of the overall population of the school to qualify to participate in the ELPA indicator. If you don't have 10, you won't get the, if you don't have a minimum of 10, let me clarify. If you don't have a minimum of 10 FE. Um, per the ELPA indicator FEI rules, you won't qualify. So you could theoretically have 10 ELs, but three of them weren't FEI, the indicator won't apply to you. Or you won't get it calculated for your site, I should say. All that student data is tracked regardless. I understand that you must order additional materials in the additional ordering window for alternate access testers, correct? If a student enrolled on the 29th day of school, how long does the district have to screen the student? Uh, so the First part, I'll let you sell the answer, but on the second part, um, technically it's one day. I mean, but again, understand that, understand that we have to write guidance within, within the, the boundaries that federal law establishes. That's, that's, just, a, that's just what we have to do. Um, but so technically you would have one day. I, I just leave it at that. Um, you're actually able to order um, materials for alternate access testers already now. So you, um, it's already available. Okay. Okay. Will the state upload the students info for pre ID labels for WIDA access? Um, we are not doing labels, correct? Yeah. It still has we'll get labels. Yeah. We'll get the actual sticker, yeah, sticker the labels. For, for, okay. the for the ones that have paper, um, access, they just look at those labels. Okay, so labels for paper access, pre-ID, and we're actually um, going to be opening a new pre -ID, uh, WIDA pre-code um, report in the WAVE, and you'll probably get notification on that tomorrow morning. And that is going to be the way we do some clarification on who gets uploaded into the AMS system and uh, gets their test sessions automatically created. And that's going to be done by all of that. It's going to be in uh, Weed IMS by uh, the 26th. Yeah, our final, and just FYI, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Sally. That is, or the 26th is our, our final day to have the um, state pre code file uploaded into AMS. So that should be very soon after that. You should see all of your, all of your identified ELs automatically placed in the test sessions in the, in the AMS system. Okay. Uh, code 1637 was not available on our student information system until now. Should we wait, uh, make those changes in the fall 2020, or should we make them now? I'm talking about those students whose parents have signed a waiver. Change them. I would change them now. I don't see that there's any reason to wait. Unless someone can, um, if someone sees a, a potential issue with that, feel free to uh, put a, you know, put a comment in. On state testing accommodations, students are supposed to use the accommodations all year. Is there any documentation we need to provide to prove that this happened? Within the context of, yes. Okay, so if a student, generally speaking, a student should never see a, test, a, a testing accommodation for the very first time when they take the test. It should be a component of general classroom instruction. Now, if a couple of the accommodations would not be realistic to do that in a, in a general instruction classroom all the time. That's fine. But generally speaking, if we come out to do a, a site visit, which we will choose a random ser series of sites every year to come out and do a site visit in terms of testing, we will ask to see um, potentially maybe talk to a teacher, 
um, teacher record for that student, um, talk and kind of get a feel of whether those accommodations and how those accommodations were, were implemented. There's not a formal piece of paper that we're gonna make you fill out, but it is something that is part of the observation protocol when we go to do a site visit for OSTP and WIDA testing. Okay. Uh, I just got one that says, should we wait to make? I don't, that one was from John. If you could uh, finish that one out, I'd be more than happy to address it for you. If additional accommodations are needed besides what's embedded in the alternate access, do we put those accommodations under the student profile in AMS? Um, <clears throat> all of those accommodations that are on alternate access, or those are, those are, gui those are um, guided by WIDA. And so those are the only ones that are available for that student. I mean, um, go ahead and if you had more questions, but hope that makes sense. Okay. Okay, I logged into the webinar just before it started, and then I was called to a discipline problem. <laughs> Been there. I just made it back and obviously missed the majority of the webinar. Will this be recorded and posted so I can view it? And if so, when? Yes, we'll post both. Um, we will go ahead and try to get it posted maybe tomorrow, hopefully no later than uh, Friday. Are there changes from last year in the uploading of ID files? I'm assuming this is uh, in terms of the pre-ID or pre-code for WIDA. We are gonna handle, the state is gonna handle that completely. Uh, most likely tomorrow morning, uh, if you're on the EL listserv or if you're on the assessment listserv, you'll receive a notification that, and a, a brief six minute webinar or little pre-recorded webinar that walks you through the new WIDA pre-code report. And essentially what that's gonna ask you to do is go in and verify the EL kids at your individual sites in your district. And once those students are confirmed, um, and we'll do this over the next couple of weeks, we will grab that file, that, that final file, upload it directly to AMS, and AMS will pre-populate your test sessions for you. Okay. You might have already answered this, so I apologize if so. Does each individual access tester need to be uploaded? In the okay, so that's, that's what I just, yeah, that's what we just talked about. So students who met the ELEP, ELAP band, uh, oh, are talking about, okay, the exit band last year, What's the code for these students? They code the same as any, they, it's just an alternate proficiency, alternate way to meet proficiency. So they code as any other student that met proficient at 1636, 03 or 01. Uh, so depending on, you go 1636, uh, first year proficient, and then whatever other code is appropriate given their, their um, home language survey, whether they get bilingual funding or not. Um, and are we, are we supposed to add students after 10-1 to, yeah, you, you, yeah, that's fine. We to AMS is, doesn't have, we to AMS operates in, independently from the wave. They don't, they don't talk directly to each other. Anything that's in we to AMS is there because either the district puts it there directly or the state sends them a separate file that, um, has them pre-populate, which is our WIDA pre-code file. It doesn't talk to the WAVE directly at all. Um, can you show the screen with info regarding when to screen and access and when to screen only? I'd like to snap a pic. Sure. And remember that was just within the, within the test window. Okay, right there. And again, I will post this, uh, post this to the, uh, that's probably put on the the Weta, the Apple Weta page um, in the next couple of days as soon as we can get it back. All right. Okay. If a district has students that aren't school age yet, but they are in the student information system as a student because they get extra services for speech, what should be done with those HLS and or qualifying as EL, et cetera? Most of these kids shouldn't, I mean, from a WIDA perspective, it shouldn't matter because the vast majority of these kids would be too too young to, unless you had maybe like a potential kindergartner, but if they're pre-K, um, they aren't school age yet, they wouldn't be participating in the WIDA system, in the WIDA assessments anyway. Uh, so I don't know that it would necessarily matter. Um, 
I think that if you're talking about potentially qualifying for like bilingual funding as a student goes, um, that's a bigger question and we would probably need to talk about it um, just kind of see what the exact situation is. I don't want to kind of speculate on that. Um, thank you for everything. UConn is excited for the clarifications. All right, no problem. Uh, we have at least another 10 or 15 minutes if you want to uh, ask some more questions. I have no problems with that. But we have come to the, uh, that was the last comment that was put in a couple of minutes ago. Okay. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Dr. Linnae said I did a good job. So there, there you go. Okay. Oh, here's one. Our district gets students from the Children's Center in, in Bethany. These students attend classes sporadically depending on when they're available to attend. I was told by your special services coordinator that we have never collect by our, our, our special services coordinator that we have never collect, collected HLS students on these students. Should we be collecting an HLS? So I think it kind of, it depends. Are they actually enrolled in Bethany with a teacher of record and how old are they? And I, just, I would need to know a little bit more about the situation. I tell you what, um, that's a pretty specific circumstance. Um, if you want to shoot me an email directly, uh, we can probably figure that one out. Okay. All right. How do I know what EL code to give a 1637 student in my student information system? We can't know. I know that sounds like, I know that's, that's like the worst answer. But unfortunately, there's uh, seven or eight uh, student information systems operating in the state of Oklahoma. And we don't always know exactly what one thing, we, we use what we know, which is the 16th, the four digit code, which is the SIF code that applies to that particular function in the translation between your information system and the wave. What that actually looks like on your side can be a button, it can be a drop down menu. There's no rules about how when gauge or power school or infinite campus or anything how they how they show that to you so the in cases like this what i what i recommend to everybody um, especially that's going to be doing a lot of work in their student information system with els is download the bilingual identification processes packet and go through it with the customer service agent for your 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 basically your tech support for your student information system on the other line and say okay I need to know exactly when it says 1636.03 I, for this kid, because I know that's what given our, given the state flow charts, I know exactly what that this is, that's what this, this student needs to code as. I need you to tell me exactly what's going to feed that code to the wave in this information system and just go through that entire packet and make sure that you, that customer service guy or whoever tells you exactly what needs to get pushed in that system to make that happen. That's what I recommend to everybody. And since these guys all operate independently, we can't, we can't provide you that kind of guidance. Uh, if we're providing an IEP based accommodation for access that doesn't require extra materials, are we to simply add that accommodation through DRC prior to testing? Yes. Yes, that's correct. That's all you need to do. Okay. Uh, how does the wave determine, determine it if it's if, okay. If a band exit student uh, needs further documentation to exit, what email list should someone be on to get that info that clarif uh, clarifying documentation is needed? So all everything that happens within the band exit happens within the band exit application through the accountability reporting um, application on single sign on. If you submit something, if you submit a band exit request and everything is everything basically attaches to that digital file for that student's ELP band exit. Um, and any notification that we, if we, if we review it on our side and we need, you know, a, I don't know, another uh, star, star test or something along those lines, we will send you a notification through that system. So the best thing to do is ensure that when you, that you are the per that whoever's email that, I'm sorry, restate that. Mm -hmm. Every one of those digital files has an email associated with it. And usually it's who it's, it's, it's someone in the district that's managing somewhere in accountability or district test coordinator, something along those lines. So 
if that ELPA request gets submitted, you just need to make sure that whoever that email address is associated with that ELPA ban request is going to know that 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 request is coming back to them because that automatic if we say we need this test report and put it in as a comment it automatically generates that as an email and sends it to whoever's email is associated with that elba band request and then this past year uh, dan and i were really good about <clears throat> putting granted or denied on the resolution part of that yeah. so you can you were able to go back in there and see if your um, request was granted or denied yeah you and you can like I said even if you didn't get the email if you go back into the into the the band request application and look at the students that you submitted if it's a comment and not and requesting something even if you miss the email you know that you need to put something in there but that's that's how it operates okay I think we stopped on that particular question okay if a exit band student need further oh does it say why it was denied? Generally, yes. Uh, I don't know that we we said, I don't think you did. I didn't see any. We, if it was denied, we we told you why. Um, generally speaking, and we didn't um, generally put denied in unless it was, like an, on an initial submission, we didn't put denied unless the student, it was just straightforward that the student simply wasn't eligible to exit. There was a couple that you know, there was no question about it. There's no documentation that you could have submitted that would have gotten that kid through just yes. they were a first grader, you know, I mean, they're just not eligible. So um, generally speaking, we would deny it without giving you necessary, maybe just say the student too young to exit denied something along those lines. But anything that was denied after that, or kind of that next next level up was denied because we asked for something and we just didn't get it back. And there was probably maybe I don't know, 50 or 60 maybe, or, you know, maybe 50 or 60 requests that we had asked districts for additional information and then we just never heard anything back from them. And then, so it would just say, didn't we, when we closed everything out, we just put denied as the, generally put denied as the final comment. Okay. All right. I think that was the last question. All right. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and wrap things up. So I'd like to thank everyone for your time today. Um, we will go ahead and, um, like I said, I will try to address that ASL question and thank you for that. That's, that's I really do appreciate everyone's, uh, participation in this and that's the questions like that are the exact reason that we want to do things like this. Cause you guys always think of more stuff than we can think of together. And I want to say that we generally appreciate, genuinely appreciate everyone's willingness to come in and spend an hour of your time and really help us out and kind of create the best policy that we can. Um, oh, we got another last minute question here. Will there be a way for us to know if a kiddo has exited in another district via the ELP band? I know it's been in the works, but an idea when that will be available. So we did. Um, after so essentially what we did is we worked with the office of accountability and we sent uh, blanket emails to every if, if a student did fall into the category where they exited in an elp band but they were at a different uh a different site the next year that new site got an email that said this this kiddo in your in your site was exited by the elp band so we that we're, we're, we'll probably change it up a little bit for next year in terms of how we structured that, but that is already a process that we have in place. And we, when we did try to alert districts so they can know how to code um, specific kids. Uh, if you do have a question about, and you know, one kiddo or another, feel free to shoot Yuseli and I or an email and we can um, let you know if they exited out or not. That's no problem. Okay. Um, for screen only or both last consecutive, sorry. Oh, for screen only or both last consecutive instructional days, our spring break is in the middle. Yeah, and that's we went away from consecutive. It's just it's just instructional. So if you if you have maybe your spring break falls in the last three weeks of the, the idea was is that if the last ten or the last three weeks of the weeded test window, your spring break is right in that second week that you would have you could basically if you're, if you count by instructional days back that brings you to the you know essentially three weeks before the end of the test window 
So that's just it. We're looking 10 consecutive days. If that student enrolls within the, within, or the 10 instructional days prior to the end of the test window, you just screen. If they're enrolled previous to the last 10 instructional days of the test window, you would screen and, and give them the WIDA access. Okay, is it correct that the previous district is the one responsible for exiting them out? Yes, they're, and actually it's, it's, they're the only ones that can because uh, the new district for an ELPA ban request won't have access to even grab them. You know, accountability always wants one year behind. So the, the, the district, even though they're technically doing this at the, you know, kind of at the beginning of the next school year, they're exiting out kids that they may not have anymore. That student might have left out the WIDA test window ended. That student left in the last week of the previous year, enrolled in, a, in the two districts over um, at the beginning of the next year. But that previous district, will, they're the only ones that'll have the option to do an Alpha Band request. And we do request that they do. Um, you know, for the plain, I mean, for the plain simple reason is that uh, if that student has exited out one, even though the, the previous year district um, or the district that no longer has a student, if they exit that student out, they'll still get the point for that year's accountability. So it, it's good for them. And then that, that, you know, then moves that student out and they're in their next district. Okay. Uh, are we to scores in my data on the wave? The 2019 ones are not yet. Uh, we were trying to get, we're going to try to get those up. 2018 is there. So hopefully fairly quickly, we will have those posted. At least they weren't the last time I checked. It was a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that might be it. All right. Um, again, I wanted to tell everyone that I really appreciate your time. I'm Dan Rule, and that's my, my phone number and contact information. Feel free to reach out whenever I can be of any assistance. And you, Sally, um, for any of your, your WIDA-related needs can uh, get you taken care of. We're going to go ahead and get wrapped up, and we want to say that we um, just really enjoyed this today. So thanks a lot, and look forward to the notification tomorrow regarding WIDA pre-code and this uh, PowerPoint potentially being posted, maybe amended a little bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks a lot, Pete. We really appreciate it. Thank you.